Amen. You may be seated. I love the fact that we're in this series about loving our neighbor. And as my dad shared last week about doing good things to show God's goodness, today we're going to talk about, so when do you actually have to say something? And the person that's going to be sharing the word with us is a good friend of mine, and his name is Pastor Mark Palampo. Mark and I have a a little bit of things in common, but we'll see, maybe not so much. One thing we do have in common is that we both grew up as pastor's kids, and our fathers are men of God that have helped to lead God's church and have given us shoulders on which to stand. Pastor Mark leads New Hope Central Oahu over in the Mililani Wahiawai area, along with his lovely wife, Jaylee, and their children. Uh, They get to be with us today. What a blessing. I also want to recognize uh, Pastor Mark's father, Pastor Mike Palampo, who's actually sitting right here in the front. Would you welcome him as a part of our Metro family? We honor you, Pastor Mike, because we recognize that uh, Pastor Mike was one of my Bible college professors, and he helped to uh, shape and form part of my ministry philosophy along the way. I'm so grateful for men like you and other men and women who have helped to shape the next generation of what God is doing. So thank you. Well, without further ado, I know you're going to love the message at 7 o'clock. It was powerful. Put your hands together. Big, a big Metro welcome for Pastor Mark Palampo. All right, bro, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Well, Aloha Metro Christian Church Ohana. It's so great to be here. As Pastor Brandon said, I'm Mark if we haven't met, and I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely thrilled. Uh, I am joined by my wife, Jaylee, who's here as well, as well as our good friends, Michael and Skye. You'll get to hear their testimony a little later this morning. Uh, It was a surprise, actually, to see my dad in the house this morning, as well well as Pastor Jen as well. So thank you guys for being here this morning. But, uh, you know, I was, I got to say, a little surprised uh, when Pastor Brandon invited me to speak, because usually when a guest speaker is brought in, it's because they share some sort of commonality, some sort of overlap. But Pastor Brandon could not have picked a more radically different person from himself to be here this morning. So just a little bit, you know, I grew up here in Hawaii, born and raised. Um, My dad also, like his, uh, was a pastor within the New Hope movement under Pastor Wayne Cordero before branching out and planting his own church. Uh, similar to Brandon, I mean, I, after high school, went to L.A. to go to school. Go Trojans. No, not USC. Mililani high, high School. That was my alma mater. Uh, OIA champions this year, too, by the way. But um, <clears throat> after graduating from college, moved back to Hawaii and uh, joined the church where my dad was pastoring. Got my start in youth ministry before becoming a pastor. Went on to marry the love of my life, Jaylee, who was also a transplant from the mainland. And we have three beautiful children together. In fact, our kids' ages are seven, six, five, four, and two. And some of them even share similar birth months, same birth months there. My wife also serves on the worship team at our church. And just this past year, I stepped into the role of lead pastor with my dad taking on the role of founding pastor. So I guess what I'm saying is, if Pastor Brandon could have invited himself to come and guest speak, I'd be what you'd get. Uh, Basically, like when you remove one Dixie cup, another one plops into place is, is, is what's happening here this morning. So you might not know this, but when people need an MC. Pastor Brandon's the, the consummate MC, but when he's not available, I'm the guy they call. I'm like his understudy, you know? I'm like the poor man's Brandon Ahu. And so once again this weekend, he was unavailable, so, so here I am. And I'm blessed to be here with all of you this morning. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I've just been so blessed and encouraged by what God has been doing in and through this church and the surrounding community. I've been following this series as well. And uh, man, Pastor Elwin's message last week about what God has been doing through your faithfulness in the surrounding community was such an encouragement to me. And, um, you know, I am believing with you guys for 20 more years at least of impact in the community and uh, Brandon didn't share this but you know he and his dad have that father-son pastoring relationship just like my dad and I and they have actually been a huge blessing and inspiration to us and so uh, we are so encouraged by your church and by your pastoral team in fact I kind of feel like an honorary ahu sometimes myself you know it's like Brandon and Mark Brahu and Marhu well, well we'll work on that we'll work on that But it's great to be in this series this morning. I'm so excited about the season that you guys are in because I think that this is something that God is doing across the church as a whole. Getting us outside of the church, loving our neighbors, being his light, being his love. As we say in our church, being his agents of aloha wherever we go, amen, and bringing that light to the people. Because that's exactly what we read in scripture about the early church. That's the way that they were. And I feel like God is calling us back to that original intent. 
you know? And so, you know, uh, when you read the Bible and when you read about the church in Acts, sometimes it's hard not to think, man, uh, are we still experiencing that same thing today? You know, uh, Pastor Francis Chan kind of put it this way. He said, imagine you were stranded on a deserted island. And one day you were foraging for food or supplies and you unearthed a copy of the New Testament. The Gospels, the book of Acts, the letters. And he said, imagine you had no prior knowledge or background in Christianity. You didn't know about Jesus. You didn't know about the church. But you started reading this New Testament. You read through the Gospels. And then you got to the book of Acts. And you read about this people, this church, they called it. This spirit-empowered people, they had the presence of God living within them, and it showed. Thousands were being added to their number daily. Their lives were marked with miracles, signs, and wonders. People were being resurrected from the dead. People were being healed. You know, the gospel was just going forth. You read about the impact that they had. Now imagine that you were rescued from that island, and you were brought back to America, and you visited a local church. Now, be honest with me. How many of you think you would come away from that experience thinking, yes, that's exactly what I imagined church would be like based on what I read? And for those of us who grew up in the church, who've been around church for many, many years, how many of us have ever had a sneaking suspicion that, is this really what it was supposed to be? Or was there always meant to be more? So how is it then that we have come so far from what Jesus originally intended? Pastor Bill Johnson puts it this way. He tells a story of a, a pastor who wanted to get involved with his church building project. Only problem was he didn't have any previous building experience or knowledge. But he had a heart that was willing to help. And so he talked to the contractor and the contractor said, well, if you really want to help, here's what we need. We need 100 two by four boards cut to six foot lengths. So take these two by fours, cut them to six foot lengths, and we need a hundred of them by tomorrow so that they'll be ready and prepped by the time the builders show up to the site. So the pastor said, I can do that. I can do that. So he took out his tape measure that evening and he laid the first two by four down and he measured six feet and he made his mark and he cut. But instead of using his measuring tape for the second board, he just took that first board, laid it on top of the second board, made his measurement and cut. Then he took the second board, put it on the third board, made his line and cut. And he did this for every board. Now, if any of you know, the pastor had no building experience, so he didn't realize that by using this method of measurement, every time he made his cut, it was about an eighth of an inch beyond where it needed to be. And, you know, that eighth of an inch didn't make much of a difference on the second board, but by the time he cut the 100th board, it was over seven feet long. And the work of the pastor was useless to the builder. The next, team, the next day, the team showed up, and they completely had to remeasure and recut everything the pastor had worked so hard to do the night before. And Pastor Bill goes on to say that sometimes we can approach church and ministry the exact same way. As long as we measure ourselves to recent standards of success in church ministry, it might seem like we're doing pretty well. But when we compare ourselves to what Jesus began 2,000 years ago in the first expression of church, I think we'll come to find that there's quite a difference that has taken place. So why is that? Why is there such a difference? What was the standard that Jesus established for his church 2,000 years ago? Here it is. We find it in Matthew chapter 6. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus is teaching his disciples how to live and how to pray and what to contend for with their lives. And this is what he tells them. He says this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus told them to pray and to live as if they were bringing on earth the reality of heaven. So in our home as in heaven, in my school as in heaven, in my neighborhood as in heaven, on my block as in heaven, this is how he told them to pray. You see, as long as we simply measure 
the standard of our success as the church to recent standards of measurement, it might be tempting to think, hey, we're doing pretty good, right? After all, most churches around have a pretty decent-sized congregation. We've got some relatively nice buildings to gather in. Maybe our church finances are always in the black. But what was the standard of success that Jesus established for his church 2,000 years ago? You ready? It was to heavenize the entire world. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're here to heavenize the world. (laughs) And if that is our standard of success, then how are we doing now? That was the standard that Jesus set. Heavenize the entire world on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're contending for on earth as in heaven. So the purpose of the church was to heavenize the world. And if that's our purpose, then what's our strategy? I mean, surely for something as critical as that, Jesus probably spoke at length to his disciples about things like church planting, church leadership, church budget. Well, would it surprise you to know that throughout the entire body of Jesus' teachings, he only talks about the church two times, two times. That blew my mind when I found out about that. But what Jesus says about his church, more importantly, the word that he used for church tells us almost everything we need to know about both the purpose of the church and how it was meant to function. The first of the only two verses where Jesus mentions the church is found famously in Matthew chapter 16. Many of you are probably familiar with this passage. Matthew 16, Jesus says this, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. As Jesus is preparing to establish his church, interestingly, he first has to decide what he's going to call it. You know, he could have very easily have said, On this rock I will build my club. Or on this rock, I will build my religion. Interestingly, he also didn't say, on this rock, I will build my synagogue. Or on this rock, I will build my temple. Those would have been very familiar concepts to his Jewish followers. But instead, Jesus went with a different word. Another word that would have been familiar to his followers, but not in the way that you might think, He said on this rock, I will build my church. Only he didn't say church because that's our English translation. So what did he say in the original language? He said, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my, here it is, ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And a lot of how we're understanding the ecclesia, its purpose, its function, and the history behind it is actually, a lot of it has been informed by Dr. Ed Silvoso from Transform Our World. And this call to be the ecclesia that Jesus established. You see, the reason why this was an interesting choice for the church was because whereas the synagogue or the temple were spiritual places of worship, ecclesia was a secular concept. So why did Jesus choose that term? Well, how many of us know the heart of our Lord is not merely for safe spiritual gatherings, but for that which has yet to be redeemed? Amen? So Jesus chose this word that was familiar to his followers. You see, the ecclesia was a concept that was originally started by the Greeks and then later adopted by the Romans. Of course, the Romans were the ones who were currently in power. Jesus' followers and he himself were living under Roman occupation. That's why they knew all about the ecclesia. A Roman ecclesia was a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place or assembly. This is why those in the ecclesia were also known as the called out ones. This is fascinating In the Roman Empire, these citizens, or called out ones, check this out, they were deputized by Caesar himself. In other words, they carried the weight and the authority of Caesar himself to enact and enforce his will and his decrees 
in the area of their jurisdiction. Wherever two or three Roman citizens gathered, they had the weight and the authority to enact the will of Caesar himself. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. Ask anything of me and it will be granted to you because wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am there with you. Interesting. Interesting. This ecclesia was established to ensure that the policies and decrees of Rome were enforced throughout the region of their jurisdiction. We actually read about one of these secular ecclesias in Rome in Acts chapter 19 in the Roman city of Ephesus. And the city's being thrown into an uproar because of the gospel message of Paul and his followers. And it gets so bad, it's, you know, about to blow up. It's about to turn into this ugly riot that the city clerk has to intervene. In Acts chapter 19 verse 39, the city clerk says, if there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. That assembly is the word ecclesia. It was a secular concept. Again, this assembly ensured that the policies and decrees of Rome were enacted and enforced throughout the region of their jurisdiction. So how it worked was, whenever Rome's armies marched into an enemy territory and conquered it, Caesar was now the king of that land. And what Caesar would do is he would establish an ecclesia in that conquered territory. And what that ecclesia would do is they would enforce and enact the will of Rome, listen, until every man, woman, and child in that territory thought, lived, believed, and eat, slept, drank like a citizen of Rome. Their mission was in essence to Romanize that territory until everyone within it looked like a citizen of Rome and matched every other territory in Rome. I hope you catch the significance of this church. You see, because Jesus could have chosen any word to describe his movement. He could have said synagogue. He could have said religion. He could have said temple. And those would have been very, very familiar terms to his listeners. But he went with another term they were also familiar with. And in using this word, ecclesia, the called out ones, his message was loud and clear. He did not come to establish a religion. He did not come to establish a safe Sunday spiritual gathering. Jesus came to establish a world-changing, world-heavenizing force. His message to his followers was this. You are now my called out ones. I am calling you out of the darkness of this world. And I am deputizing you with the power and authority of heaven itself. You now carry my name. And I'm going to give you the power and the authority to cast out unclean spirits, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to preach the good news of my kingdom. Take heart because I have overcome the world. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now I am establishing my ecclesia, my movement. And my movement will be so powerful that not even the gates of hell itself will be able to stand against it. When my ecclesia goes forth, there will be no power on earth, not even Rome, will be, will be able to stand against what my kingdom has come to do. And you listen to the words of this backwater, ho-dunk town carpenter telling his ragtag group of fishermen we are going to change the world, and not even Rome will be able to stop us. You can look at that and think, what a lunatic. The audacity of this guy to think that him and his fishermen friends were going to change the world, if not for the fact that they did. That's why we're here today. That's why you and I are here today. Did you know that Hawaii is the furthest place in the world from Israel? When Jesus says, you will go in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, in parentheses, is Hawaii. If you were to take a globe and poke a, a stake through one end in Israel and pop it out the other end, it would pop out in Hawaii. Their message went to the ends of the earth. They changed the world. And even the superpower of that day, Rome, who crucified Jesus, one day came to acknowledge him as Lord and King. 
This was the calling of the church. Church was never meant to be a Sunday spiritual gathering, brothers and sisters. It was always intended to be a 24-7 world heavenizing force. And I believe that God is calling his church back to that glory. No, we're not contending for God to do something he did in a past era. We're believing for the new thing that God wants to do in our day. And he is pouring out his spirit like never before. He is activating his church to go out. And it's bigger than any one congregation. It's bigger than any one church, any one city. God is raising up churches and people and believers all over the earth to go out and heavenize his world. And so how do we do this? Because like Pastor Brandon said, every single one of us has been given a sphere that we're called to heavenize, a sphere that we're called to contend for. You've been given influence. You've been given authority, right? You have your pick six. These are the people that God has put on your heart. And so how do we contend for the reality of heaven in the midst of our world? Well, fortunately for us, Jesus gives us a model. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, the passage that we just read. And so let's unpack Jesus' model for heavenizing our world. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 1, it says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Jesus sent his disciples to prepare the way. Why? Because he was going to go where he sent them. Jesus has sent us out into the world. And listen, wherever Jesus has sent you is where he's planning to go. Jesus is going to show up in your neighborhood. Jesus is going to show up in your school. Jesus wants to show up in your place of business. Jesus wants to show up in your community. Jesus wants to show up in this city. And he sent us ahead of him to prepare the way. I don't have time to unpack the significance of him sending them out two by two in pairs. But I also don't want to gloss over that. Because if you think about it, Jesus had 72 people that he could have sent in 72 directions. But he didn't do that. He paired them up. He halved his workforce. Jesus, why would you do that? You could have reached 72 places instead of just 36. 36, right? Okay, yeah. Milani. Sorry, Milani graduate. Matt's not my strong suit, but 36 teams went out. Listen, that was intentional because we're not meant to do this alone. As we are going out as agents of Aloha, as we are going out to love our neighbors, listen, you cannot do it alone. We cannot do this alone. The Bible talks time and time again about this, the significance and the power of doing this together, right? Find your battle buddy. Right? As Jesus said, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. He is sending his followers out into the front lines, into enemy territory to take back what the enemy has stolen. Your unbelieving friends and family, your unbelieving neighbors. Listen, that's the enemy territory. And as we go bringing the love and light of Jesus, the enemy's not just going to, oh, I'm sorry, here, you can have it back. He's not going to do that. He's not going down without a fight. So you need to surround yourself with like-minded believers who are going to contend, who are going to be in the battle with you. I didn't share this in the first service, but I'm feeling led now to share that, you know, there are sort of like four levels of engagement that we can find ourselves in when we go to work, when we go to school, just even in our own neighborhood. The first is just to merely survive, right? Right? These are the people who show up to work and, and they put their head down and their main objective is, I just want to make it through the week with as little obstacles and as little challenges as possible so I can get back to Sunday and just get pumped back up. So I can survive another week and then just get beat up, deflated, and, and pumped back up, right? The second group of people, they apply biblical principles to their life. And they do this also to survive, because they found that without God, it's really hard to survive the battles and the challenges of this world. So they apply biblical principles to themselves, but also just to survive. And then you have the next level up of people, and they are filled with the presence of God. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not just surviving, they're thriving. 
And the Holy Spirit helps them to actually make it through the week and feel like, man, things are awesome. I'm doing great. I'm not just like, I don't come to church on Sunday feeling like I'm all beat up. Like the Holy Spirit is sustaining me. But listen, here's the reality about those first three groups of people. Their objective is, I don't want to change the world. I just don't want the, tr- the world to change me. So I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to f- be filled with the Spirit, not so I can change my world, but just so the world doesn't change me. Do you realize what we're settling for there is a stalemate with the world, a stalemate with the enemy? What we're saying is, devil, I won't mess with what you have, but you better not mess with what I have. And so we'll just call it a stalemate. Listen, we were never called to a stalemate with the devil. We were called to take this world for God's kingdom. And for too long, I believe the church has been playing defense against the ropes. Man, look around. We're getting pummeled, guys. We're losing our schools. We're losing the government. We're losing entertainment and media. Man, at what point are we going to get off the ropes and say, God, I want to get in this fight. I don't want to play defense anymore. Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail against you. Do you realize that the gates, gates are not offensive. The gates are not going to come after us. Gates are defensive. And Jesus says, I have the key, folks, and I've kicked down the door. Now I need you to storm the enemy territory, and it will not be able to prevail against you. But you need to go into enemy territory. We need to go and heavenize our world. We can't settle for a stalemate any longer. We need to take back ground for the kingdom. So the Lord appointed 72, and he sent them out to prepare the way. Verse 2, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. I want to ask you a question. This is the group of 72 that Jesus sent out. He had previously sent out his 12 to do a very similar thing. Now, of the 12, pop quiz, how many of them, by trade or profession, were pastors? Zero. Any of them ministers, clergy? None of them. Most of them were fishers or, you know, uh, of a similar trade. Here's the point. When Jesus is asking for workers to go into the harvest, he's not talking about paid professionals. He's not talking about pastors. He's not talking about clergy. He's not talking about full-time ministers. He's looking for anyone with a willing heart. That's who the 72 were. These guys were not pastors. These guys were not ministers. So we have, to, we have to get out of this mindset that says, yeah, my workplace will be reached, you know, maybe if Pastor Brandon showed up, maybe I should invite him. You know, the world is not going to be won through pastors. Pastors aren't going to win the world. Pastors are great, and they have their purpose. But when Jesus is looking for workers, he's looking for people who have a heart to be sent into the harvest field. Because the harvest is plentiful and ripe. There are people all around us who need what we have. You know, I got to admit, I think that the Western modern church, we have reached the pinnacle of the Sunday expression. I mean, we, we, we are, we're maxed out, guys. If you look at some of these churches today, state-of-the-art technology, laser show, amphitheater, arena, beautiful music. I mean, it's just like, it's amazing what church expression has become. My question is, as we've gotten better at church, have our communities gotten any better around us? See, the answer to changing the world is not going to be better church service. You know, more pastors. It's not. It's going to be when the people of God, his ecclesia, his called out ones, go and bring heaven to their sphere. It's going to take every single one of us. It's bigger than any one congregation, any pastor, any team. It's going to require every single one of us. And so how do we do this? I love this. The first thing Jesus tells his disciples to do is to speak peace. He says, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. 
If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Jesus is saying, wherever you go, wherever I send you, bless that place. Come in peace. Jesus is saying, our message ought to be, we're not of this world, but we come in peace. So when you go to your workplace, when you go to your office, when you go back home, when you go, if you, you know, walk your neighborhood, wherever your feet take you, speak peace. Pronounce peace. Bless the area where God has sent you. You have a sphere of influence that I don't have access to. You have a sphere of authority and influence that Pastor Brandon is probably not welcomed in. But you are because they trust you there. When you go to these places, come with the spirit of aloha, God's aloha, to bless that place, to bless it, to speak peace. So oftentimes, the reason why we're not motivated to share the love of Jesus is because, quite frankly, we don't like the people who are around us. We don't really like our coworkers. We don't really get along with our neighbors. We don't like our classmates, so we just try to get through it. Jesus is saying there has to be something that shifts in our heart where we're able to look at the people around us and actually desire peace for them, desire to bless them. How many of us know we should not talk to our friends about Jesus until we've talked to Jesus about our friends? We should not talk to our coworkers about Jesus until we've talked to Jesus about our coworkers and asked him, Lord, would you please give me your heart for them? Because I don't like them. But you love them. And so I need you to change the way I see them. Change my heart so that I can come. And I can come with a spirit that wants to genuinely bless them. Because if you try to share the gospel of Jesus to someone without love, sharing the good news of Jesus without love is like kissing someone with bad breath. It's like a nice gesture, but it's not going to be well received. We need to be filled with the love and aloha of Jesus wherever we go so that we can genuinely bless those who are around us. And when we contend for the blessing of God wherever we go, man, as simple as sitting at your desk, right? And it's not like you have to, is this thing on? Excuse me, I'd like to make an, an announcement today at work, right? No, just sitting at your desk, just, God, would you bless this office this morning? Would you bless my coworkers as they come in today? Bless their families. Man, watch how God begins to shift your heart for the people around you. You begin to notice them. You begin to see them. You begin to hear them in a way that is different. And what you're doing is you're shifting the atmosphere for the supernatural to take place. When you invite God's presence into a space, man, the atmosphere becomes charged with the presence of God and anything is possible at that point. So speak peace. And bless wherever you go. Number two, Jesus said to establish two-way fellowship. And that's important, that it is two-way. He says, stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. He's saying, get planted, get rooted, and get to know the people around you. And he's saying, if they want to bless you, if they want to, you know, do something for you, receive it. I think as Christians, so often we, we don't want to do that. We're like, no, no, I'm the one who's here to give. I'm the one who's here to minister. I'm the one who's here to provide. And you know, as Christians, you know what we are, whether we realize it or not, sometimes what we communicate to our unbelieving friends and family is that they really have no value and nothing of worth to offer until they become Christians. That's kind of the air that we give. It's like, I I'm here to minister to you, not the other way around. Man, have you ever been with someone who is always trying to fix you? <laughs> you don't really want to be their friend. You kind of want to avoid them. And yet sometimes I'm guilty of having that air when I'm, trying, when I'm around people that don't know Jesus. Just like, you know, you don't have what I got. No, Jesus is saying, man, there ought to be genuine, authentic, two-way relationship here. Right? When you love the person in front of you for who they are and not just who you want them to be, that communicates so much of the love of Jesus. So love, genuinely love the people that he has placed in front of you. They're not our project. They're not our mission. They are people that God has called us to love into the kingdom. 
And so we need to develop genuine, authentic relationship with them. And when we do that, it will open the door to number three, meet felt needs. Jesus says in verse 9, heal the sick who are there. He said, when you show up to this town, when you contend for my presence and you bless those who are there and you come and you build relationship with them and you're not moving around from place to place, but you get rooted and you build relationship with them, guess what? They're going to start to open up to you and they're going to start to share things with you. You're going to start to see needs all around you. People will start to share some of the things that they're going through. Some of you guys are in this season right now. You know, you're, you're building relationship with your neighbors. You've got friends, coworkers, teammates, classmates, and they know that something's different about you. And now they're starting to open up to you, right? And they're starting to share things with you because there's something different about you, right? This church is having tremendous impact in this community. God is opening so many doors and he's going to open doors in our lives as well with the people around us. And they're going to begin to bring their needs to us. And Jesus says, bring my healing. Something as simple as saying, hey, you know, you've shared this before. And, you know, can we pray for that? Can I pray about that? Man, that's going to go so far in ministering and sharing the love of Jesus to them. And then finally, number four, Jesus said, proclaim the gospel. The end of verse 9, he says, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But you notice the proclamation came at the very end of all these other things that he asked his disciples to do. So many times as Christians, we make the mistake of showing up in a place and just the first thing we want to do is proclaim. But we haven't been a blessing. We haven't gotten to know people. We haven't heard their needs. We haven't ministered. So why would they want to hear what we have? And, and this is exactly what, you know, the pastors have been sharing throughout this entire series. It's lifestyle evangelism. And when we live this way, when we really love the people around us and we usher in the presence of heaven into the places where God is sending us, watch how God continues to open opportunities for us to then proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And it could be something as simple as asking the question, hey, do you know God? Do you know God? I want to have you guys listen to a powerful testimony this morning of a couple who previously was far from God, didn't know him, until someone asked a very simple question that changed everything in their lives and now the lives of the people around them. Would you help me welcome up this morning Michael and Skye as they come up to share their testimony today? check. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank God for having us here tonight and bringing all of you guys here this morning. And thank you for Pastor Mark for inviting us. And thank you, Pastor Brandon, for inviting us as well. And thank you, Metro Church, for having us here today. And wow, that message from Pastor Mark was just so powerful and very resonating for us because that is like the main reason why we are here today. You know, like we come from a place where somebody shared the word with us and now we're able to share it in front of a church and we never thought we would be standing up here in front of a lot of people. <laughs> um, so to begin, oh, I'm Sky. I'm Michael. Um, I'm a first grade teacher at Pohokea Elementary School. Um, I served four years in the Army, been out for like a year and a half working at a solar company, but recently just got accepted in the Space Force, will be leaving on December 1st. P kind of a big part of this testimony you'll see soon. <laughs> so on June 12th of this year was the day that our lives changed, but leading up to this day, we lived a life of darkness. So throughout my whole childhood, my parents always showed me love. They're very loving parents, but I always felt a void that I didn't know what it was. So I tried to fill this void with attention from my friends or attention from boys. And this led to a pattern of, this pattern led to depression and anxiety. And the depression and anxiety got so bad to the point where I started drinking, 
uh, doing a lot of drugs and going out and partying like every single weekend. And it try, I tried to cope with all the things that I was going through in my mind, but the next morning I would wake up and anxiety and depression would still be there. So I'd keep doing it and doing it. Then I tried to do a healthier approach to curing my anxiety and my depression, and I actually went to therapy. So during therapy, they taught me how to cope with the anxiety attacks or like depression times I would have in my room, but it never really taught me how to get rid of it. So about a year into therapy, I never got better, and then I stopped going. And it, during this point, like I always thought in my head, I didn't need anyone, I can do this on my own, I'm gonna get a good education, I'm gonna get a good job, I got it, you know? And you know, that's what we get taught growing up. Go to school, get a good education, you'll be set for life. Nothing deeper than that. For me, I was also living in darkness. Um, during this time, I, I sent an application last year, December, for the Space Force. And thinking this process was going to take through two or three months, I kind of planned ahead before getting the word from my recruiter. So I ended up not doing another semester of school. I, quit it. I ended up quitting my restaurant job thinking that I'm leaving in a couple weeks. Well, I was wrong, and it lasted longer than I expected. Um, it dragged out for months, and this was the start of my life going downhill. I became very impatient, angry, filled with anxiety, and I lost hope. And Sky pretty much dealt with that person every single day. Um, every day I would wake up, I couldn't even find a reason to get out of bed. On a good day, I would get out of bed at 12 p.m. on a great day. Some, most of the time it would be 2 p.m. Um, I was gaming every day. Sometimes I would play eight hours like there was no tomorrow. Drinking every weekend with friends, coping with all the anxiety. Every, all the sadness that I was just holding in. During this time, I lost count on how many times I tried to quit nicotine. I've been vaping since, before this, I was vaping for seven years of my life. C tried to quit o over 100 times, couldn't, couldn't figure it out. Um, I was also addicted to the websites. I couldn't, I was addicted to lust. It was a lot of things I was dealing with and not seeking help. I thought I got it on my own. Same thing with Sky, my parents told me. You got this, you can figure it out on your own. And I lived that, lived that mindset throughout my whole life. This was even the worst part during this time. Um, my grandpa passed away this past April. This is the, the grandpa that helped raise me since I was a baby. The grandpa that changed my diapers. The grandpa that picked me up and dropped me off from school, from elementary to high school. The grandpa that landed his car when I got my license. The grandpa that lived in the same house for 18 years of my life. The grandpa who lived the Christian life always preaching about God and was always loving and joyful and a great grandparent to his grandchildren. And I didn't have an ounce of care or emotion for his passing. I was so confused with my life. I asked this guy all the time, why am I like this? What, is it, what am I going to do with my life? I have no emotion. I don't even care that the grandpa that took care of me growing up just passed away. This was rock bottom of my life. Whew. On this day, um, on June 12, five, exactly five months ago of this today, I was doing my regular Uber shifts. I picked up this young lady close to my age. And it was a typical, you know, hello, how's your day going? You know, why are you headed here? You know, and after three or four minutes of that conversation, it was complete silence. Out of nowhere, this lady asked me, do you believe in God? <laughs> when she asked me this question, my whole, the whole world stopped. I had goosebumps throughout this whole ride. I was at the lowest point of my life, confused. And it took me a while to answer her and just said, I believe there is a higher power out there. I just don't know what he wants and who he is. She explained her part of her story of how he, she met God and how she built a relationship. So I went to ask her, how do you build a relationship with God? And she tells me four things that I need to start doing. She told me, read the Bible, listen to worship music, start praying, and find a great Christian church. We ended this car ride with a prayer that she led. Ever since that day, 
our lives has never been the same. On that happened on June 12th, on the month of July, before the month of July, June 30th, out of nowhere, I woke up telling myself, I want to be sober this whole month of month of July. I told this to Sky, and she was willing to go on the ride with me. So the whole month of July, we've been sober, and we have been sober ever since. <laughs> all the addictions I was dealing with, all the lust addictions, all the nicotine, all the drinking was pretty much gone. You would have even recognized me. I told, um, if you told my friends or family that I'm speaking right now, show them a video, they will still tell you you're lying. That is not him. And I don't blame them. That is how dark my past was. Um, on the month of August, after a month of being sober, I felt we felt God's love throughout this moment. Uh, we started reading the Bible. Uh, I got hired out of the solar company. I started listening to work, uh, Bible readings, sermons for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Started praying 10 hours a day, just having a relationship with God and fell in love every second of that day. I stopped swearing. <laughs> I completely renewed our minds. God circumcised our hearts. Then on to the month of September. On September 3rd, we found New Hope Central Oahu. That is where we met some amazing people and built a church ohana there. Um, during the first service, it really moved both of us. And it was the first time we felt at home. Mm -hmm. um, that first service was, man, if I could live that, t that worship time, um, I couldn't stop crying for 20 minutes. I grew up Catholic with my family, went to church every Sunday. I just fell asleep at church. Never once in my life I would think I would be crying or even singing at church. But throughout that whole worship, I couldn't stop saying thank you, Jesus, for 20 minutes and was bawling in tears. And I felt like I was at home for the first time. Luckily, we asked, is there a baptism coming soon? And in God's timing, it was in two weeks after that first service. So we, we happily said, we want to get baptized. Um, we kind of shared our testimony with our pastors, and they were amazed on how God has been working in our lives. And we were voluntold to share our testimony. <laughs> um, I'm not a person to speak in front of people. Um, this was a big challenge, but I took the challenge. Also for Sky. Yeah, so on September 17th was when we got baptized. Uh, Pastor Mark was able to baptize us. Um, and then since that day, like, our family and friends came to support us. Uh, and they just saw how our lives changed that day. And since that day, we actually started our own fellowship that we hold on Wednesday nights at his house. So we have, like, about 9 to 10 friends that come. One of our friends is actually here with us tonight. And during that, like, fellowship, we just create a message, share our testimonies, allow our friends to share their testimonies as well, and just sharing our journeys together with our friends. So that power of sharing it is like a ripple effect. That ripple effect starts with a small drop that grows into something bigger. I learned this from Pastor... Um, Teresa. Teresa, sorry. Pastor Teresa last night, where... The ripple effect started with a small drop. That small drop was Jesus and his 12 disciples. Now it has grown into something bigger. Now we have so many churches. Like Pastor Mark said, we're the farthest place from Israel. And it got all the way here to an island in the middle of nowhere. So it's pretty amazing about what sharing the gospel and Jesus' word can do for everyone. And it's... It's impacted our lives so much that next week at our church at New Hope Central Oahu, we will be giving our testimony again. And this time, all of our family and friends are coming and co-workers will be coming that 25 to like 30 people are coming. And most of them are non-believers. My dad even told me at my baptism, don't ask me to come to church. I'm not going to come. And then he's going to come next week. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the funny thing I realized after that baptism, I also, I texted as a pastor Mark, was 
God has given us, Sky and I, this gift of sharing this amazing journey that God has given us. But we asked our family and friends to come and watch our testimony, thinking they are going to celebrate and just be happy for us, not knowing we're using this opportunity to plant that seed and letting them feel God's heart for the first, that love for the first time, as how I felt when on that Uber ride. And that Uber passenger that, that talked to me on June 12, the crazy thing is, She's a fellow sister at this church. Uh, her, her name is Bella. She's right there. <laughs> That's our baptism. <laughs> and yeah, if, if she never asked that simple question, I don't know if I, I would be here standing right here or not even just being alive. Uh, that's how dark my life was. I want to close out this testimony with a book that I'm reading that my mom actually gave me. It's called... The, uh, the Purpose Driven Life, uh, authored by Rick Warren. Rick Warren speaks about his father. Uh, Rick Warren's father was a minister for over 55 years. He was a simple preacher. His father built over 100 churches around the world. He died in cancer in 1999. In his final week of his life, his disease kept him awake in a semi-conscious state nearly 24 hours a day. As he dreamed, he would talk out loud, and Rick would learn so much just by listening to him. On his final night, his father tried to get out of bed. Of course, he was too weak, and Rick's wife instead insisted him to lay back down, but it didn't stop him. His wife finally asked him, what are you trying to do? His father replied, got to save one more for Jesus, got to save one more for Jesus. He repeated that phrase over and over for the next hour. As Rick sat by his bed with tears flowing down his cheeks, he bowed his head at, his, at this moment. His dad reached out, placed his frail hand on his head and said, save one more for Jesus, save one more for Jesus. And Rick Warren intended that to be the theme of his, the rest of his life. This story touched my heart so much. I read this yesterday morning at work. And it correlates with the message today, but it kind of confirms on how Sky and I have been living our lives since that Uber ride, where we are a vessel for God. This is not me celebrating on our journey. This is me sharing for you to touch, for me to touch your heart. God using me to touch your hearts, give you faith and strength for his purpose to save more for Jesus. I just want everyone to be challenged. I just want to challenge everyone to to have that mentality, and I promise you, zero regrets. And if we all, as a church, can say, "Save one more for Jesus," all together on a count of three, it would be an amazing moment. Uh, one, one, two, three. Save one more for Jesus, and thank you, God, for us, for an amazing testimony. Love you. Would you extend a hand with me? Let's pray over Mike and Sky. Lord, we just thank you that this is uh, what you've placed on their hearts, and it's pretty evident, of a transformed life and just this idea to save one more for Jesus. And more than an idea is what you said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And I thank you, Lord, that we see this in front of us, the evidence of hearts that have been redeemed by grace. We see just how much they've received because of what you've done in their hearts. So we pray not just for this time and not just next week at their church, but their lives would be a testimony of how good you are. Thank you, Lord, that as this fire burns within them of their salvation, of what you've given to them, we pray that as you continue to deepen their roots within you, that we see how much you're going to do through young people whose hearts are dedicated unto you. So we bless them now in your name, and we thank you that we get to hear a testimony of your goodness as we save one, two, and thousands more in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We bless them now in your name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Would you thank them one more time for sharing?